We are going to be continuing the discussion of archetypal figures in Hellenistic philosophy, specifically Socrates of Athens. This um, piece of artwork is from a study that Raphael made for that famous painting of the School of Athens, and now that they've uncovered some studies and drawings he did for it, the incredible detail, he went into it and just read this fascinating article about it, and just um, the way that he represents Socrates' ugliness in this, which you don't really get when you're taking in the, uh, the, the whole picture that has something like 40 different philosophers in it. But he brings out this like <clears throat> one character trait that we can actually say with some definitiveness we know about Socrates, that the guy was ugly. Um, and so that we actually have this story that goes back to a dialogue, a Socratic dialogue, written by somebody in the fourth century who probably knew Socrates, but wasn't Plato, wasn't Xenophon, wasn't Aristophanes, wasn't one of these better names. But he tells this story about um, Socrates and some of his friends being visited by a person who's trained in physiognomy. And physiognomy is the science, or rather pseudoscience, of being able to identify things about people's personality from aspects of their appearance. And so this physiognomist named uh, Zapyrus shows up, he looks at Socrates, and he makes a diagnosis that this person must be very stupid, you can tell by the way his neck is shaped, and you can also tell that he's immoderate and addicted to women. And all of Socrates' friends laugh at this and say, this is ridiculous, you don't know what you're talking about, and obviously this physiognomy stuff is bullshit and a pseudoscience, <laughs> because Socrates has more self-control than anyone, and he's the wisest person in Greece, so that shows that you're wrong. And then Socrates, however, intervenes and comes to the defense of the physiognomist, and he says, no, it's true, I am totally addicted to women and immoderate. It's only because of my cultivated virtue that I am able to overcome those intense desires. And yes, naturally I'm stupid, but it's only because of my concerted efforts that I have become wiser than other people. And it's a wonderful story which actually touches on some deep issues about fate and about virtue and vice and science and other things, and Socrates is at the center of this story, but none of it probably ever happened. It's probably just a literary fiction that was designed to amuse or maybe even just to sell books. And it's a good introduction to what we call the Socratic problem or the Socratic question. That's a scholarly term. And the, the problem arises from the following set of facts. First, Socrates wrote nothing. He did a lot of philosophy, but he didn't write anything. And he didn't found uh, a school of his own. So practically all of the things that we associate, and, and he denied that he ever did any teaching. So the things that we most associate with philosophy now, writing books and teaching, Socrates did none of them. And yet he's considered the paradigm of a philosopher. Furthermore, immediately after his death, he became the subject of an entire new genre of literature called the Socratic Dialogue. So, writing stories about Socrates interacting with his friends and enemies and people like Zapyrus and Alcibiades and so forth became a general thing that lots of different people wrote dialogues about. And there are at least a dozen known authors of Socratic dialogues, and most of these, however, have not survived, or survive only in fragments or reports, like the one I just shared with you. Although Plato's and Xenophon's 
Socratic dialogues do survive, and I'll say a little bit more about those in due course. Now, the problem deepens because the way that these writers of Socratic dialogues portray Socrates diverges and differs, and the way what it represents his philosophical activity as being about, and even the beliefs that he holds, are different. And this is most pronounced with respect to his defense speech, which he gave in court when he was answering charges of being corrupted on corrupting the youth and so forth, and that he was ultimately executed for. So he apparently gave a speech in his own defense, and both Plato and Xenophon give us representations of his defense speech, or his apologia, but they differ in crucial details. So the question arises, which one of them is right? Or rather, that question gives rise to a deeper question of how could we ever know what actually happened? And these aren't just the literary fictions of these authors themselves. To yeah. what extent do they differ in their portrayal? Well, what's interesting is that they do overlap to some extent. And so then we can make perhaps an assumption that where they overlap, we've sort of triangulated facts about what really happened, and then where they differ might be peculiarities of the matter due to Plato's or Xenophon's own agenda in representing Socrates. So that's not a very easy question to answer. And, and, and what somebody who's serious about answering the question does is, first of all, gets these very easy to access texts, Xenophon's Apology and Socrates' Apology, <coughs> and compares them. And I've done this, broken it down, broken Xenophons down into about 15 different sections or so, and it looks like, you know, seven or eight maybe have similarities, but then, you know, the topics might be similar, but the exact position represented differs, or the diction used to make the point, or the point within the speech in which it's made, it's very complicated. But it shows something about comparison of, of philosophical um, views. But the problem, the problem remains. We cannot clearly take either one as being an historical document of what actually happened, because Socrates didn't write it down. It's a speech that he gave extemporaneously at the time. And we know that Xenophon and Plato have their own philosophical agendas and want to portray Socrates in certain ways in order to further those agendas. And even within a single source, for example, Plato, Socrates is portrayed as holding different views, in fact, incompatible views. For example, in the Gorgias, he's portrayed as completely rejecting hedonism, the view that the purpose of life is pleasure, whereas in the Protagoras, he defends a form of hedonism in his argument. So which is it? Was he a hedonist or wasn't he a hedonist? And as I'll show later, he gives rise to later schools which interpret him in connection with their own views. So for example, the Cyrenaics, who found their own hedonistic school and their founder was a member of the Socratic circle, take this idea of Socratic hedonism seriously and sort of run with it. But then another school like that of Antisthenes, who influenced the Cynics, who influenced the Stoics, who reject hedonism, say pleasure is worthless and has nothing to do with happiness in life whatsoever, um, but it's all about virtue, they will also claim some support in their even anti-hedonistic views from the views of Socrates. Um, furthermore, those are, that's just two examples of dogmatic schools, right? One that holds that hedonism is true and is the basis of life, and another that says pleasure is irrelevant to life and rejects hedonism. Those are both dogmatic positions that actually take a position on it. But there's other people who were influenced by Socrates who say, we don't take a position on whether hedonism is true or not. And that was Socrates' position, was not to have a position on them, but just to argue both positions out. Okay, so there's, there's even a meta level here on which people are influenced by 
Socrates and claim to be influenced by him and claim to be working with Socratic methods and philosophy, but to totally different purposes and ends that are incompatible. So that is what we call the Socratic problem or the Socratic question. I guess the question is, what were his actual views? And the problem is, we can't ever figure out what those views are because we don't have a time machine. All we have is later writers with their own agendas. So we have to be aware of those, of those contexts. Now, the earliest evidence for Socrates, the very earliest by far, is in the comedian Aristophanes' Clouds, which is the only source that we have about Socrates that was written in his own lifetime. And it's incredibly negative and abusive and makes Socrates basically look like a clown and look, look like a horrible scourge and, a, and, and like he's actually corrupting the young and so forth. And Plato depicts Socrates as rejecting this account in his Apology and being aware that it has influenced and affected his reputation. Now, some people think that is the most accurate evidence about Socrates. Not only is it by far the earliest, but that's probably what he was like. And that's, and you know, for one thing, his ugliness makes him perfect for comedy. Everybody laughs at people that are ugly. In fact, you make these comic exaggerations of ugliness in Greek comedy, and you didn't really have to do the exaggerations in Socrates' case. That's sort of what he really looked like. So he fit the bill in terms of the spectacle of it, but also his unconventional views and unconventional lifestyle and so forth could easily be mocked and so on. And so some people think that's probably our most accurate representation of him that we're ever going to get. But in fact, when you think about it a, a bit deeper, the image that's made of Socrates in those works can't possibly be true, because it's a composite image of three different types of intellectuals that existed in this time period, not just one. So one of these is of a sophist, that means somebody who basically trained someone to be a lawyer or an attorney, that is, train someone how to make worse arguments sound better than they really are. Okay, that's one thing that he's portrayed as doing, is being someone who can train you to beat anyone in court, even if your argument's uh, worse than your opponent's. Another is that he's portrayed as being a sort of atheistic natural philosopher like Anaxagoras, who denies the existence of traditional gods, makes up his own and so on. And the third is portraying him as an ascetic moral teacher who's totally indifferent to worldly matters and only cares about the state of his own soul and this sort of thing. Okay, so because those are types that we have very many other representatives of and we can attach names like Anaxagoras and um, Gorgias, uh, and Diogenes and so forth to these various character types and then see the way that they've been consolidated into one character in the comedic brilliance of Aristophanes and that it isn't anything like a biographical representation of an individual but rather a kind of sketch and for obvious purposes Socrates fits the bill. Now the later evidence for Socrates comes down in the first place to Plato who is the first person to produce an entire corpus of philosophy. Well, actually the first person to do that was Democritus, but since none of those works have survived, we can't assess its unity and so forth as a corpus. So the oldest one to survive are the works of Plato and the dialogues of Plato, which have dramatic settings, named characters, and these characters exchange speeches debating about philosophical topics. And all of Plato's genuine works, except the very last work and longest work that he wrote called The Laws, in all of the rest of Plato's work, Socrates is a character. And in most of them, he's the main character. And Plato was a pupil of Socrates. He was in the circle 
of Socrates, and he vigorously defends Socrates' views. But he also uses Socrates as a kind of literary puppet to represent his own views and his own arguments. And that's related to the Socratic problem I introduced before. And so, Socrates is portrayed as defending incompatible views, as I said about hedonism, for example, and that's just so in order to further local philosophical debates that Plato is pursuing in those various dialogues. And Plato isn't trying to come up with an overall systematic account and coherent account of Socrates' philosophy. Now, other than Plato, there's also Xenophon, who wrote an extensive work called Memoirs of Socrates, which, as I mentioned before, includes an apologia, or defense speech of Socrates. And he, like Plato, was a pupil of Socrates and a member of his inner circle. His work, even more so than Plato, seems entirely designed to defend Socrates against the charges that were brought against him. So to portray Socrates as not being someone who's an atheistic natural philosopher who invents false gods, but makes him seem as somebody who's devoutly religious, pious, and believes that um, intelligent design creationism explains everything in the natural world and we don't need naturalistic philosophy and so forth. Um, and to defend charges against corrupting the youth, it shows him being very concerned with the education of the youth, and so on and so on. Um, furthermore, Xenophon is at least partly dependent on Plato. This is another complication of comparing their accounts, is that we can't tell that even where there's a similarity, that that is, like I was saying, triangulating a fact about what actually happened. It could be that the similarity is due to Xenophon picking up on a good point or a good, nice rhetorical move that Plato had made and incorporating it into his own work. And then there are other testimonia about Socrates that aren't reducible to either of these sources or to Aristophanes reports that we find in Aristotle. And then, of course, in today's reading, the account of Socrates in Diogenes Laertius, which gives us a biography and goes through a lot of the points on this slide that I won't go into detail. There are some questions about his exact birthday. There are some descriptions of his illustrious military career, which are mostly meant to show him manifesting the virtue of courage. There is a question about his education. There are many people that, he's, that are said to be to have been his teacher in Diogenes Laertius. Diogenes Laertius does not mention the person who Socrates is made to say is his teacher in the symposium, which is a female philosopher named Diotima, um, who somebody recently suggested is actually a mask for Aspasia, who um, is, was a leading female um, intellectual and Solon's uh, companion. I'm sorry, Pericles, companion, a uh, politician, uh, during the democratic uh, <coughs> period in Athens. Now, um, Socrates, of course, had this enormous reputation for wisdom, and apparently even the D Delphic Oracle was consulted about who is the wisest person in Greece, and it was said that no one is wiser than Socrates. There are reports about his marriage or his marriages, so he either had one or two wives, and there's this suggestion in various other reports that he also had girlfriends, possibly including Aspasia. Um, there is his involvement in politics and civic affairs, the way that he conducted himself on trials and so forth. He is portrayed as criticizing both Democrats and oligarchs, He's portrayed as being essentially the first urban individual in history, somebody who never leaves the city of Athens. He doesn't, he's, he's once portrayed in Plato as leaving the city walls to go sit under a tree and talk about philosophy. Otherwise, everything he does is in the middle of town and in the workshops and the citadels and sanctuaries within um, Athens. Um, he mentored 
several controversial people, the most controversial being Alcibiades, but lots of other people who went on to political careers and whose political fortunes and reputations um, went up and down, and with them, in a way, Socrates, who was portrayed as being responsible for these people. Diogenes Laertius also mentions his refusal to accept payment for teaching, and his refusal to claim or admit that he was a professional teacher of any subject. Diogenes Laertius also gives us some details about his trial, the conviction, and his execution by drinking hemlock. Um, and Diogenes Laertius doesn't, doesn't mention this, but it's a fact about Socrates is that he becomes this emblem of all of philosophy and gets made into a kind of philosophical martyr, somebody who died for the cause of philosophy, and then a paradigm of the philosophical sage, again, as we'll see throughout the Hellenistic period, certainly. And then he is compared to figures like Confucius and Jesus um, as being, you know, essentially starting a moral revolution in his own environment through his uh, teachings and so on. Uh, even though all of the people I just mentioned probably never wrote anything. Okay, now let's look in a little bit more detail about the charges that were brought against Socrates, because this seems to have some external validity. By all account, he was charged, there really was a trial. What was he supposed to be guilty of? Needless curiosity meddling interference and inquiring into things beneath the earth and in the sky, and also on the surface of the earth. Um, that's one charge, not a very clear charge, a fairly vague charge, but it looks like basically a description of philosophical activity. Um, <laughs> second, making the weak argument stronger and teaching other people to do the same, the charge that's always leveled against sophists. Now you can make big money doing this, teach in law school, but back then it was kind of a, considered a kind of shady enterprise. Um, then another set of charges that we have a name attached to them, somebody who supposedly was the actual prosecutor in the case, Melodus. Socrates is supposed to have been guilty of corrupting the youth, and again, that may have been connected to controversial people that he mentored, like Alcibiades, but also of impiety and irreligion, not acknowledging the god that the city, the gods that the city acknowledges, but creating and making up new divinities of his own. And there are some great portrayals in artwork of the outcome of that trial, which was that he was found guilty and ordered to drink hemlock, so he was executed. Here's an 18th century, the most famous piece. This is in the New York Metropolitan Art Museum. Um, here is a really, uh, you, you should look at these slides when you have some more um, time. They incorporate literary elements from Plato's and Xenophon's accounts into these depictions of what the other people were doing and what the prison looked like and so forth. Now, go back to the Delphic Oracle for a moment because the Delphic Oracle and people's response to it seems to have been part of his problem. So this friend of Socrates named Cherophon consulted the oracle at Delphi. The oracle is a prophetic oracle located in this temple in central Greece. It has an inscription over it that says, Know thyself, which becomes maybe the most important um, ethical prescription even in Greek uh, philosophy. And Cherophon asked this oracle, Is there anyone wiser than Socrates? And the answer was no. No one is wiser than Socrates. But if Socrates doesn't teach rhetoric, like logic, how to make the worst argument sound better and so forth, and he doesn't teach natural science, then the question is, why did he get a reputation for wisdom? So on the next couple of slides, I'm going to give some aspects of his philosophy that we gather from these later sources and try to characterize the views that he became most famous for. Now, the most important is perhaps just the portrayal of him doing philosophy, and so the activity of philosophy. 
uncompromising devotion to ethical inquiry. So talking to everybody that you meet and trying to get to the bottom of what they're doing and whether it's right or wrong and whether they're living their life well or not. And so one thing he says in, in the defense speech is that the unexamined life isn't worth living for a human being. And so you should examine not only your own life, but help other people examine theirs. And this is kind of what his activity was about. Let's, let's talk about your problems. Let's figure out what it is and let's examine your life. And he describes himself, or at least Plato has him describe himself in the Theaetetus, as a gadfly that's constantly bugging the cow of Athens and making it, uh, uh, making it improve itself, and also describes the effect that he has as being like a stingray who stuns his opponents and they're, and they're sort of um, dumbfounded and babble in his presence and can't, can't get their arguments together and are made to contradict themselves. Another image that he's made to present himself with is being not a teacher, but a so-called intellectual midwife who helps ideas that are nourished within the pupil helps bring them to life. And that doesn't doesn't it's not a model of a student as an empty vessel that you pour knowledge into, but instead the it's a more organic conception where the student themselves is is producing these ideas and so forth, and that and that the um, and that Socrates will help bring those things into viability so that they can survive as ideas and grow into something more important and more formidable. And he's associated with the Socratic method, what we call the Socratic method or the elenchus, which literally just means something like refutation, a method of examining and refuting various positions preceding by question and answer. One way to think of what he's doing here is a kind of hypothesis testing. You, the student proposes some answer to a question, and then you ask them a series, a series of questions about what that answer presupposes until you elicit a contradiction in their view, and so then think that that answer can't be correct, then move on to the next hypothetically correct answer, and the one that's left standing after this process of refutation and examination will be the view that you take to be most uh, true. There's also what we call Socratic irony, although it's difficult to say exactly what that means, but it has to do with his statement that the oracle at Delphi is correct, that he is the wisest person of, in Athens, and he is the wisest person in Athens because he knows that he doesn't know anything whereas other people wander around thinking that they know stuff when they don't actually know anything. Socrates at least knows that he doesn't know anything, therefore he knows something, therefore he is wiser than all of those people who don't know. But an aspect of the irony of this position is that it professes to intellectual humility. I don't know anything. And yet Socrates never loses an argument. He always takes his opponent apart in these portrayals in the Socratic dialogues. So it's always his opponent is shown to be ignorant, thinking that they had knowledge, like Euthyphro thinking he knows what piety is, or um, Thrasymachus thinking he knows what justice is and then being shown that, no, you don't, and you're contradicting yourself, and your views are all incompatible um, with them. And so this, this is what, what seems to make it ironic, is that it is at once an um, intellectually humble thing to say, and at the same time a very arrogant thing to say, that my intellectual humility makes me a lot smarter than you, and a lot better at... Uh, at this than you are. Um, there is also the fact of his rejection of natural inquiry and his focus on the search for definition standards and criteria only of moral virtues and his kind of discouragement of getting involved in all this logic chopping and trying to figure out what nature is and so forth and wanting you to focus on his, his, his vision of philosophy and so possibly if he's correct about this, 
The only time you're really doing philosophy is when you get together with a small group of people in person and debate about the definition of some moral virtue, like courage or justice, and you keep trying to figure that out. That's what philosophy is, in his view. Yeah, question. Uh, in order to match Socrates' method to function, does the software himself can predict the logic of his pupil's answer? Well, he doesn't himself offer an answer to the question. Right? He asks a question, an answer is given by somebody who, who supposes that they know, and then a series of questions are asked about the implications of that answer that show the view to be incoherent, and that they shouldn't be holding that as if they know it. And so the, this method can be employed without any commitment to any view whatsoever. Okay. Any example on this case? See that, for instance, how on justice, what question he asked, and what was the answer, and how he could detect the contradiction. Yes, so for, for that you need to read The Republic, a ten, ten book work by Plato depicting him doing that. And an easier way to get a sample of it would be to look at a small work like The Euthyphro, where the question is, what is piety or holiness? And Plato, uh, and Socrates runs into a guy who says, I'm a professor of religious studies. I know all about religion. I can explain it to anyone. What do you want to know? And Socrates says, well, I want to know what holiness actually is. And um, he goes through a series of bad answers, like, oh, it's what I'm doing now, or it's, um, it's uh, what's favored by the gods, or it's what's favored by some of the gods, or it's doing service to the gods, or, and all of these are shown to be incoherent. They can't possibly be what holiness is, or else it doesn't make any sense. And the dialogue ends in confusion, perplexity, and what we in Greek call aporia. Okay, so it looks like a totally negative result. But progress is made, because before you read the dialogue, you thought, somebody must know what this concept means. I, you might even think you know what it means. Oh, it means praying to the gods and doing the right kinds of sacrifices or whatever. Or it's whatever God likes. It's whatever God says he wants to happen in the Bible. That's what, that's what holiness is. But then you read the dialogue, and you go through this kind of refutative method, and you realize those answers don't make any sense. And so then you realize, I don't really know what this means. I don't understand what this is. Further inquiry is necessary. Perhaps there isn't any meaning, and it's a meaningless concept. So there is still intellectual progress made without any commitment being made to a position. In fact, what you're doing is destroying commitment to positions, where it shouldn't have been held, because it was held without an actual rational basis. It sounds yeah. was equally as good at uh, persuading as he was dissuading. Uh, what are some of the things that he persuaded people? Well, that, that's, a, that's a curious thing, because are, are any examples given where that's stated? Um, uh, so this is, this is like in, on, on my page 11 in section 29. Um, he showed equal ability in both directions, persuading and dissuading men. Thus, after conversing with Theaetius about knowledge, he sent him away, as Plato says, fired with a divine impulse. But when Euthyphro had indicted his father for manslaughter, Socrates, after some conversation with him on piety, diverted him from this purpose. So there it's making it as if he had this effect on actual action. Euthyphro was going to prosecute his father for murdering a slave or something and saying he was doing it on the basis of it's the holy and um, pious thing to do to prosecute your father if they do something wrong. But Socrates shows that you don't even know what you're talking about with holiness and, and, and you're not even making any sense. And so he's discouraged from acting on that and whereas he encouraged by inspiring Theotetus to look further into the question of what is knowledge. But, in, but that's an odd way to describe the results of those dialogues. So that's, Diogenes Laertius is making the point based on the dialogue Theotetus, a dialogue addressed to the issue, what is knowledge, a dialogue that ends in 
confusion, perplexity, and aporia about the question is of what is knowledge. It's not just a true account. It's not just a justified true account. It's not just a justified true belief. What is it? Um, we thought we knew going ahead, somebody must know what knowledge is, but we read the dialogue and we realize there's all these problems with any definition we attempt to give of it. A problem that's yet to be solved in philosophy. And the other dialogue he's referring to is the Euthyphro, the one about piety. Again, it doesn't end in a persuasion. He doesn't say, let me persuade you not to prosecute your father. It ends in confusion and perplexity about what piety or holiness really is. And that confusion or perplexity may have an indirect effect of encouraging or discouraging action, but that is a sort of incidental result of this activity, which is, which is a purely intellectual inquiry into the definitions of these ethical concepts. Excuse me. I, yeah. I just would like to know that uh, the dialectic method that Hegel talks about is the same as the one that Socrates is founded? Or well, different? I don't know. To answer that, we'd have to read a couple thousand pages of Hegel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, which you're welcome to do, because we have courses on it. But, but um, dialectic, in the way I'm using it right now, essentially means conversation, having a conversation, having a question and answer format of an exchange, like we're doing right now. This is dialectic, okay? But what this dialectical method does is elicits contradictions. Like if you start asking me questions and you say, well, but doesn't Socrates, you said before that Socrates is this and that, and it turns out I don't know what I'm talking about and I'm contradicting myself and none of these, none of these facts cohere with each other, then we're really doing, that's a dialectical examination of what I'm, what I'm saying. Or if, if, any, if, if one of you had a view about justice or about piety and we examined it, then that would be doing dialectic or doing philosophy. But the word itself just means conversation, question and answer. Okay? Now, here are some positive aspects, however, I think we can take away. Um, so, as I've said, these inquiries into what is piety, what is knowledge, what is justice, what is virtue, although they result in aporia, or confusion, or perplexity, that nonetheless is a positive result, and can set up a research agenda to figure out, okay, all of these other attempts to define justice, for example, defining it as helping friends and hurting enemies, or repaying debts, two of the definitions of justice considered in the Republic. We realize those aren't going to work, so we need something else. Um, like distributing to each person in accordance with their worth or something like that. Um, and, or we need to distinguish between multiple kinds of justice, like distributive justice versus corrective justice or retributive justice or something like that. Or we need to distinguish between multiple kinds of virtue, intellectual virtue and moral virtue. And then we can get clearer on what these things are. So the, the first step in order to make progress is to make sure you get rid of the garbage input into the process so that you can clear that away and operate on the basis of what's solid and perhaps build a better theory. And so Socrates does start that because apparently prior to him doing all of this, everybody just went around it acting like they knew what all these things were. And we don't have record of there being a kind of systematic attempt to examine and define these things prior to this. Um, now, here are some very positive views that I think can, with some confidence, be attributed to him. Intellectualism, the thesis that the virtues, and by virtues I mean things like courage, self-control, justice, and so forth, they are just forms of knowledge. Like, justice is knowing what is right and wrong. And courage is knowing what should be feared and what should not, and so on. And we make analogies to other crafts like architecture and medicine and the way that these are able to achieve definite results. And we try to think of morality along a similar lines. That, in other words, lines that we can, we can break down what architects do into different elements and smaller pieces and have a rational account of how they're able to 
build a structure that protects us against weather and intruders, or preserves our health and prevents disease. We can give a rational account of all that happen, how all that happens. Can we also give a similar kind of rational technical account of how somebody becomes good or bad, or just or unjust, or holy or unholy? And then a thesis about unity of the virtues. Since each of the individual virtues are just kinds of knowledge, they're all forms of wisdom. And one is either wise or isn't wise. If one is wise, then it seems one will possess all of the virtues. But if one lacks any particular virtue, then one is not wise and is thought to lack all virtues. Now, that's actually a fairly paradoxical view. And as I'll show in a moment, a way to think about Socrates is to think about a number of paradoxes that he generates relative to our um, unexamined beliefs. I just want to really briefly touch on his influence on the later history of philosophy. First of all, the most important thematic influence I've already emphasized, getting philosophy focused on practical ethical matters. As Cicero puts it, calling philosophy down from the heavens, not trying to explain the shape and order of the cosmos, but what's going on within our own households and between us and our friends and that sort of thing. Um, previously, lay stuff that we call philosophy had centered on nature and natural explanation, like in Democritus, like, like we saw in part in Democritus, and in his predecessors like Empedocles, Anaxagoras, Anaximenes, and so on, Thales, Empedocles. Um, Modern scholarship follows the ancients' leads in referring to philosophers that operate before Socrates as being pre-Socratic philosophers. And so we actually make this division between philosophers that came before Socrates and those that came after because of this sea change in philosophical method that he affects. But the term is actually a really bad one and we should get rid of it and shouldn't, I shouldn't have even mentioned it to you. It includes Democritus, even though Democritus was not chronologically prior to Socrates. They were actually almost exact contemporaries. And Democritus, as we saw, did not focus just on natural science, but wrote a great deal on ethics and had a great subsequent influence on ethics. And so the term pre-Socratics is misleading. Now, the immediate circle of Socrates will be looking further into each of these people, I've already said some things about um, Plato. Aristippus of Cyrene, we'll be looking at at the end of this week, founded a hedonist school known as the Cyrenaics. Antisthenes of Athens inspired the Cynic movement via Diogenes of Sinop. And um, somebody who we won't be looking much further into because it's almost entirely concerned with logic and paradoxes, Euclides of Megara, who founded a school known as the Aristics or Megarian school. Then his influence on later Hellenistic philosophy, that Megarian school flourished, and there were other works, none of them fully intact, but fragments. There were several phases of Plato's academy, including a, a, a new phase called the New Academy, led by a character, Arcesilaus, who will be reading some fragments about him, who interpreted Socrates as being a strictly skeptical inquirer, and he extended this so-called academic skepticism beyond the areas investigated by Socrates, like ethics, into logic and physics. The Cyrenaics, as I've mentioned, a, a flourishing school of hedonism. The Cynics, inspired by Antisthenes and Diogenes of Sinop, who Aristotle calls a Socrates gone mad. Um, the Stoics, influenced via the Cynics, led by Zeno of Kidium, they regarded Socrates as being a straight-up sage who knew what was good and bad for humans and lived his own life fully in accordance with it and actually his own lived his death in accordance with it. And they assumed that he had a complete system of ethics worked out, but that he didn't he wanted to elicit it from students themselves and bring it pedagogically out of them instead of this model, again, of empty vessels that you pour knowledge into. And that's why he didn't express it in the form of treatises and so forth. That becomes the job of later Stoics who defend the unity of 
virtue thesis and intellectualism and so forth, and then try to prop that view up with dogmatic views about logic and nature. Um, the one school uninfluenced by Socrates and who actually has hostile and negative invective to say about Socrates are the Epicureans. And so I've given you a bunch of divergent interpretations of Socrates. If you look at the negative or hostile view of Aristophanes and compare it with the positive views of Plato and Xenophon, or we could compare the conventional versus radical Socrates in Xenophon versus Plato, or different representations of Socrates within Plato, or Socrates' influence on his immediate circles, hedonists and anti-hedonists, and also his influence on both dogmatic schools like hedonists, anti-hedonists, and skeptical influences like Antisthenes and, and um, uh, like, like Carneades in the New Academy. And here's a summary of some Socratic paradoxes. No one desires anything that's bad. People only desire what's good. No one does anything wrong willingly or knowingly. It's impossible to do anything wrong willingly or knowingly. All virtue is just a kind of knowledge. Knowledgeable, if somebody is knowledgeable, they are necessarily virtuous, and if they are ignorant, they're necessarily vicious. Virtue is both necessary and sufficient for happiness. If you have it, you're happy. If you don't have it, it's impossible for you to be happy. And my favorite rhetoric or training in speaking, like they give you in law school, is only useful for either indicting yourself if you do something wrong, or your friends if they've done something wrong, or helping your enemies escape punishment. That could be a useful thing to learn about in law school. Helping people you hate get off and, and, and be found not guilty of crimes they in fact committed.